Draco Malfoy and the cousin he never asked for. Thank you very much. But Draco will hear about this. Chapter 2. Time Turners and Buggets. The new term started off in a turbulent way, and Draco was not sure he liked it very much. Draco had taken up divination and care of magical creatures, mainly because Harry had chosen them, but he had not counted in that the number of people interested in these subjects may well be big enough for them to be divided into groups. He ended up with the Gryffindors for Hagrid's class, but the number of Gryffindors and Hufflepuffs taking up divination was so big that they got a class of their own, while Slytherin and Ravenclaws had to share. He ended up with Hermione for ancient runes and arithmancy, at least, since the number of students taking up these difficult subjects was small enough for everyone to share one course. They had arithmancy first period Thursday morning, which coincided with Gryffindor divination and muggle studies, causing Hermione to use the time turner two times that very morning. She waved Draco goodbye after breakfast to follow Harry and Weasley up to the top north tower, but waited for Draco at the arithmancy classroom on the second floor of the West Wing anyways, slightly out of breath and looking utterly hassled. You won't believe what a waste of time divination was! She muttered quiet enough so that no one but Draco could hear her. The woman teaching it is ridiculous. She had us read each other's tea leaves and made a huge production of predicting everyone's misfortune and Harry's untimely death on top of it. Harry's death? Draco gasped, his voice a little too loud. She's a fraud, Draco. She predicted the death of one student each year. Professor McGonagall told us all about it. You've already been to Transfiguration? Draco asked in distraction, willing his hammering heart to calm down. Oh, yes, I couldn't slip away from Harry and Ron between the two classes. There was no time, so I went back in time before lunch. At least like that, I'll have an extra hour to sneak in for homework. After muggle studies, that is. Unless you need the time turner then, she added, looking at him inquiringly. No, no, Draco waved off. I won't need it until after care of magical creatures. My divination class conflicts with that. I see. She nodded, relieved. But you'll come to ancient ruins with me after, right? Right, Draco nodded. Merlin, this year is going to be complicated. But we'll learn so much, Hermione reminded him, her eyes glowing. I can't wait to start on arithmancy. I read a little ahead throughout the summer holidays, and... Thankfully, at that moment, Professor Vector opened the classroom door and called their class inside, for as much as Draco enjoyed studying, once Hermione prattled on about academics, there was no stopping her. After arithmancy, Hermione pulled on the time-turner and spun an hour back, disappearing into thin air right in front of Draco's eyes. It was slightly bemusing to see, even if you grew up in a wizarding family and were used to apparition. Apparition was sudden and complete, transporting a person from one place to another in the blink of an eye and with a loud snapping noise. Traveling back in time, on the other hand, was silent and made Hermione fake gradually like sand running from a sand clock. He watched her till the shadow of her had faded completely and then made his way out to the greenhouses for herbology with the Ravenclaws. After herbology, he returned to the castle for lunch and Hermione caught up with him to hand over the time-turner in a rotten mood. When Draco asked, she only huffed out Weasley's name, but offered no further explanation. When they joined Harry and Weasley on their way back out to the grounds, this time to head towards Hagrid's hut for care of magical creatures, Hermione and Weasley weren't speaking to each other, and Harry seemed glad to have someone other than them to talk to, so the two of them chatted animatedly about Hagrid's new position and what his classes would be like. Knowing Hagrid, it will probably be quite laid back, Draco mused. Well, unless, of course, we're attacked by wild beasts of any kind. Nah, you wouldn't bring anything too dangerous, Harry shrugged, though he did not seem convinced. I'm sure it'll be loads of fun. Hagrid was already waiting for them as they reached his hut, Fang pacing at his feet, and he looked impatient and exhilarated. Come on now, come on, get a move on, he called at the students lingering behind them. Got a real treat for you today, great lesson coming up. Draco exchanged a look with Harry, but they said nothing. It turned out the treat Hagrid had organized for them were hippogriffs, which was actually quite interesting, Draco had to admit, once he got past his overwhelming fear of getting his face scratched out and over the heart attack as Harry was chosen as the first student to approach one of them. 
But Harry being Harry, he nailed the task without an incident, and after they were all encouraged to approach the creatures politely and carefully as Hagrid taught them everything they need to know. It was not a bad lesson, especially when not got points taken for poking fun at their teacher, and Draco felt fiercely proud of Hagrid. After class ended, Harry and Weasley lingered to speak to their overgrown friend, but Draco and Hermione excused themselves to get to ancient runes. Draco waited till they were out of sight from Hagrid's hut until his fingers closed around the time-turner in the pocket of his robes. "'I'll meet you in front of the classroom,' he muttered to Hermione, and she nodded, her eyes lingering on Draco for a moment. "'Take care,' she whispered. "'I'll make sure no one sees you.' "'I will,' Draco promised, and he parted from her with quick steps, looking out for a place where he could hide. He ended up ducking behind a couple of trees and pulled out the delicate artifact carefully— he studied it for a few seconds, watching the golden sand move within the hourglass, and then he pulled the necklace around his neck and turned it twice. It felt like he was on a broom that was out of control, speeding backwards without his input, and all Draco could do was cling on as his surroundings spun by, shapes appearing and disappearing before Draco could identify them. Then everything came to a hold. Draco took a deep breath and checked his wristwatch. It was exactly ten minutes past one, which meant he had twenty more minutes to get up to the North Tower for divination. He carefully stored the time-turner back in his pocket before ducking out from his hiding point behind the trees and hurrying up to the castle. When he caught up with Hermione, after what had probably been the most useless lesson of his life, including history of magic with bins and defense against the dark arts with black arts, he felt more than a little hassled and in a terrible mood. Remind me again of why I was so stupid to take up divination! Drago hissed as Professor Babbling let them into the classroom. Not only is the subject complete gibberish, but the teacher is the most ridiculous old bat I have ever seen! I feel you! Hermione sighed, taking a seat towards the front as Draco claimed the one at her side. Whatever Dumbledore thought it would be a good idea to employ her, I don't understand. This is a defense against the dark arts where the teaching post is supposedly cursed. There must be more qualified teachers out there. I don't know. Draco rolled his eyes. It seems to me like everyone who takes up divination for a living must be crazy. Hermione was kept from answering when Professor Babbling started talking and Draco tried hard to focus on what she was saying, but his mind kept shutting down, which was unusual for him. Draco had never had much trouble concentrating in class, unless one counted the previous year when he had been regularly possessed by the Dark Lord's 16-year-old self, but the time travel had left his mind slightly fuzzy, making it hard to follow the lecture on basic rune reading. The effect of the two extra hours he had added to his day through the time travel showed once more towards the evening. As usual, he withdrew himself to his dormitory after dinner for homework, but he was barely through his essay for arithmancy when his eyes began to droop, exhaustion catching up with him so overwhelmingly that not even tea could wake him up to focus. He ended up going to bed far earlier than usual, wondering idly if a chance to take up a crap subject like divination was actually worth the hassle. They fell into the stressy routine of exchanging the time-turner and adding two extra hours to the day, or in Hermione's case, three to four hours, depending on where and when she decided to travel back, twice a week, and Draco could not say he enjoyed it. Every such day felt incredibly exhausting, and for the first time in his life, his homework was actually piling up. That, in addition to the Quidditch practice he had to attend twice a week, really managed to wring Drago out more than any exam revision period he'd ever had to go through. Not to mention that he really, really, with a full passion, hated divination. It was not only boring and dragged on and on in that hideous classroom full of doubtful fumes, but the quality of the course material and the teaching body were little more than a bad joke. When he mentioned quitting the whole business and going back to a normal time schedule, though, he was so viciously snapped at by a completely wrung out Hermione that he decided to keep to it for now in favor of avoiding confrontation. Other than that, the only exciting events of the first two months were Hermione and Weasley continuously nasty fights over their pets and Professor Lupin's classes. 
The Gryffindors were the first third years to have defense against the Dark Arts the Monday after their return to school and came out of the lesson in absolute awe, all going on and on about the art they had faced under Lupin's instructions. You should have seen Snape in the clothes of Neville's grandmother, Weasley howled as they had sprawled out on the grass near the lake, enjoying the last feelers of summer while doing their homework. It was hilarious, Malfoy, and when I vanished the legs of my spider, Drago tuned Weasley out as he prattled on, not needing any input into his monologue, and instead watched Harry out of the corner of his eyes, who was awfully quiet and seemed rather upset. Lupin did not let me try the bog rope. Harry confided in him the next day when the two of them had a moment for themselves. He stepped in before I could face it. Do you think he... Harry got himself off hesitating, but the message was clear to Drago even without him voicing it. He would be stupid to think you weak, Drago replied of a vehemence in his tone that made Harry meet his eyes. And Lupin does not strike me as stupid. He must have had a reason for intervening. Which would be... Harry challenged, doubt in his voice. Maybe he was wary of what form your bogart would have taken, Draco said reasonably, and Harry frowned. You fought much scarier stuff than his average 13-year-old student, you have to admit. When Harry remained in thoughtful silence, Draco added, What would your bogart have been anyway? Harry flushed and cleared his throat. The odd matter, he admitted very quietly. Draco nodded in understanding. Cannot blame you for that, he said, shuddering at the memory of their train ride, and Harry seemed to feel a little better at that. Nasty things they are. What would yours have been? Harry asked curiously. I don't know, Drago mused, frowning. I'm scared of a lot of things. Werewolves, for one. Basically anything that's in one way or another powerful enough to do me in. I'm not a brave Gryffindor, remember? You're not that bad. Harry smiled, but he let the subject drop. Drago, though, found himself faced with a question again when Lupin, about two weeks later, led them into a disused potions classroom in the dungeons where another bogart had taken residence in a storage cupboard. The Ravenclaw students have given me quite an earful about letting the Gryffindors experience Bogart's first hand, but not the rest of the houses, Lupin told them sheepishly as they all filed into the room. So I sent a rather unwilling Mr. Filch on Bogart hunt. I think he'll never forgive me for the extra work I gave him, but he knows the castle better than anyone, and thankfully he found a couple more lurking in dark places. So this is your turn on facing your very own bogart. He proceeded in asking questions about the features of a bogart, most of them answered by Drago after having talked to them so thoroughly with his friends, and explaining the spell to fight them before he instructed them all to imagine whatever scared them the most, and thinking of a way to ridicule it. Draco frowned, thinking hard. What exactly did scare him the most? He had not been lying when he told Harry that it could be a lot of things, and it was hard to pick what exactly he was most afraid of. He tried to remember at which point of his life he had been most terrified, and came up with last school year, when he had been in possession of the Dark Lord's diary. The diary, then? Maybe he could turn it into a picture book or something, he mused. Not that anyone but him would understand what the diary was. He could already see his classmates laughing at the picture of the Bogart turning into a seemingly harmless notebook when facing him. All right, Lupin announced. Are oh, you ready? Daphne, let's go with you first. Step forward, please. Daphne Greengrass was frowning as she eyed the cupboard wearily, but she seemed prepared and determined. Good. On the count of three, then, Lupin called. One, two... Three, no! With a flick of his wand, the cupboard door slammed open. Draco held his breath, and so seemed everyone else in the room. For a moment, nothing happened, and then the shape of a dragon made entirely of fire soared out of the cupboard right at Daphne. Fiend fire, Draco's mind supplied. Daphne took a step backwards, her eyes wide, but then she visibly shook herself and directed her wand at the eternal fire approaching her. Ridiculous! She called, and immediately, with a loud crack, the fire exploded into beautiful fireworks. Daphne smirked, satisfied. Well done, Lupin called. Blaze, you are next. Blaze's bogart turned into a vampire, and he charmed his teeth into jellies. Pansy, who was next, got a chimera, which she charmed into a baby lion. 
Millicent turned her yeti into a big fluffy teddy bear that sang a children's song to them. Marvelous! Lupin called, laughing. Draco, it's your turn! Draco took a deep breath and stepped forward. The bogart turned immediately, apparently thankful for a new victim, but... Much to Draco's horror, it did not take the form of the diary he had anticipated. Instead, he found Harry standing before him, deathly pale and with empty eyes. Draco stared flabbergasted as blood dripped from Harry's lips, and then he collapsed into a broken heap on the floor, unmoving. Everything in Draco's head turned into white panic as he stared at the dead body of his best friend on the floor, but... This could not be. Harry had not even been here. He could not be dead. How could he have... It was then that Professor Lupin stepped in front of Draco, blocking his path. It's not real, Draco, he said softly, facing Harry's broken body as it turned into a foggy image of what seemed to be the moon. Ridiculous, Lupin called, and the moon deflated like a balloon that had just been bulked by a needle. Theodore, you are next, he called loudly enough to stop Nat from laughing. Draco realized only a moment later that he had been laughing at him. "'It's not real, Draco,' Lupin said again, turning to face him with kind eyes, while Knott's Boggart took the shape of a werewolf. "'Do you want a moment to collect yourself, or do you want to try again?' Draco watched as Knott's werewolf turned into a dog, chasing its own tail, and steeled himself. "'I'll go again,' he announced with a nod. "'Good,' Lupin smiled and stepped out of Draco's path." The dog held in at the sight of Draco, and then it turned back into Harry's grumbled body. This time, Draco did not give himself a moment to panic. He pointed his wand at the fake corpse and called, Ridiculous! There was a loud cracking noise, and Harry's robes fell away as dozens of colored rubber balls bounced away from where the doppelganger of his best friend had lain, making high-pitched squeaking sounds with each contact of the floor. Brungans! Lupin called, delighted. Tracy, finish it off! As Tracy turned her vicious-looking merman into a goldfish jumping on the ground, Nat turned to Draco with a huge grin. Are you that scared of your boyfriend, Malfoy? He snickered nastily. How touching! Draco flushed angrily, but was kept from answering as Lupin called, Great work, all of you. I'm closing class early for the day, so let's get back to the classroom to grab your things, and then you can have an early lunch. Draco kept to the back of the group as they made their way back to Lupin's classroom, and when the students had collected their things and were leaving for the Great Hall, the teacher called, Draco, a word, please. Draco sighed, turning to Lupin wearily. After what the man had just witnessed, this could not mean anything good. Yes, Draco muttered, approaching the teacher hesitantly. As Blue Eyes watched Draco intently, he noted that Lupin was still quite young, though the gray flecking his light brown hair and the shabbiness of his clothing hid it very well. He was probably younger than his parents, even. "'Would you fancy a cup of tea before lunch?' Lupin asked suddenly, a kind smile spreading across his face. "'Tea?' Draco repeated, perplexed. "'Yes,' the professor nodded. "'I find it's much more pleasant to have a chat over some kind of beverage. What do you say?' Draco blinked and finally nodded. Being afraid of losing a loved person is not something to be ashamed of, you know, Lupin told him gently as he handed Draco a hot cup of tea a few minutes later in the privacy of his office. If anything, it shows you worry more about others than about yourself. A treat not common for Slytherins, I'd expect, so I doubt your housemates could relate to it quite as much as I can. But I think you should not take Theodore Knott's words to heart. I'm not! Drago ensured him, warming his hands on the cup before taking a sip of tea. I'm used to his comments. He's not getting to me anymore. That's good, Lupin nodded. Well, not good, actually, seeing as you seem to have quite some experience with unfriendly behavior. But I'm glad to hear you're not agonizing over his earlier taunts, at least. He was quiet for a moment, drinking from his own cup, before noting, Harry is very lucky to have a friend like you. I'm not sure about that. Draco sighed, making a face. I've been a burden more often than not, I think. I'm sure you're being too hard on yourself, Lupin mused. Harry's life being what it is, he will be faced with a lot more trouble in the future. He will need friends to look out for him and worry about him like you do. After a little pause, he added, with a voice very gentle, 
His parents would be very happy to know he has you around. Drago frowned, staring at Lupin curiously. Did you know Harry's parents? he asked. I did, Lupin nodded, a sad smile on his face. I used to be James's friend when we were your age, so I assume I do have a special interest in seeing Harry happy and well cared for. I see, Draco nodded, smiling a little. You should tell Harry that. I'm sure he'd love to talk to you about his father. You think? Lupin asked. Yes, Draco insisted. He has no memories of him, and the things people have told him have been few and anecdotal. I think he'd really enjoy learning about him from a friend's perspective. All right, then. Lupin smiled, raising his cup as if to salute him. When I find a good moment, I'll invite him to tea, too. Drago laughed, feeling a wave of affection for their new teacher and thinking that, for once, Dumbledore had made a brilliant decision considering his teaching staff. Lupin's encouragement, sadly, did not make not mocking Draco's deepest fear publicly any easier to endure. Draco could deal with the taunts all across the Slytherin common room and their dormitory. He could even deal with it during lunchtime at the Slytherin table. But when not managed to drag the whole thing out in front of Harry of all people of potions, Draco just wanted to borrow his friend's invisibility cloak and flee the country. So tell me, Potter! Nat grinned as Harry and Draco took their usual places next to each other in Slimp's classroom. How does it feel being Draco Malfoy's bangard? Harry whirled around to stare at Nat in a mix of confusion and disgust, ready to defend Draco on principle, and Draco flushed almost as scarlet as Harry's Gryffindor tie! Shut it, Nat! Draco groaned out through clenched teeth. Oh, did you not hear? Not laughed, obviously savoring the moment, knowing that he could get one over Draco. It's such a touching story, really. I cannot comprehend why dear Draco would not tell his boyfriend that what scares him most in the world is to see him die. You make such a great couple. I'm sure Lucius Malfoy is beyond himself with pride. Shut it! Draco repeated, slightly desperate, but it was too late. Comprehension had settled in Harry's green eyes, along with a slight flush in his cheeks. But mostly, it was glowering at Nut in pure rage. Before he could throw anything back at Nut, though, Snape had turned up next to them, his voice icy, as he demanded, What is going on here? Draco closed his eyes and cursed silently but steadily in his head. Of all moments for Snape to pick joining Nut in tormenting him, of course he had to choose this one. Snape was not addressing them, though. He was glaring down at Nut, an eyebrow raised in expectation, and Nut blinked in surprise, not having expected reprimand by Snape of all people. We were just talking about a defense against the Dark Arts class yesterday, Nut replied innocently. Yes, I heard you, Snape answered, lip curling, his tone icy. You think it's funny, do you? Being scared of losing a beloved person, is it a sign of weakness to you? Silence fell upon the classroom immediately. Everyone was staring at the group of them, breaths held while not paled more by the seconds. Draco was frozen, observing the scene in shock. That's not... Not muttered abashed. I meant... You've obviously never had to lose anyone in your life, or you would not joke about tasteless matters like that. Snape snapped. Twenty points from Slytherin. And you will come see me this evening for a detention, Mr. Knott. Knott looked like he had been slapped. Never in his entire time at Hogwarts had he been punished by Snape. Their head of house let his dark eyes fall upon Draco for a moment, his expression serene. Then his eyes flickered to Harry for a split second before he turned, returning to his desk. Today we will talk about how to brew an antidote to poisons. He announced, opening the class and leaving a stunned Draco in his seat. I did not dream this up, right? Harry asked him quietly as they made their way to lunch after double potions, falling into step behind Weasley and Hermione, who were, as usual, bickering about one thing or another. Snape actually defended you. He did, Draco agreed, stunned. That was unexpected, to say the very least. Tell me about it, Harry frowned. I wonder why he did that. He's always glad for an excuse to put the blame on me or you by association. That must have hit a nerve somehow, Draco mused. 
Maybe Snape's lost someone at some point of his life. It is hard to imagine that Snape could have loved anyone enough to grieve them. Harry muttered, raising his eyebrows. But who knows, maybe he's not always been such a jerk. Maybe. Draco shrugged, meeting Harry's eyes for a moment and immediately seeing the way those green eyes softened when he remembered the rest of the conversation. So, he said, finally clearing his throat, your Bogart wasn't a werewolf after all. No, Draco said, flushing all over again and redirecting his eyes onto the patch of Weasley's bag that showed traces of having been sewn shut sometime in the past, eager to avoid Harry's gaze. It wasn't. Harry hummed and then said very quietly, I know I've given you a lot of reasons to worry about me. I'm sorry. It's not your fault. Draco sighed, feeling almost sick with embarrassment. Can we just drop it? Fine. Harry muttered. Just, it's okay, you know. You shouldn't feel ashamed of feeling like this. I remember when I thought you might be dead last year and... Harry gulped. I've never been so desperate in my life. He finished. So really, I understand. Draco nodded, feeling a little better at Harry's words. He looked back up to meet his eyes, and they exchanged a sad smile before parting ways for their separate tables.